In this video, I will be going into depth exploring the layers of the psychedelic iceberg. The iceberg was posted on Reddit, and the link to the original post is in the description if you want to follow along the journey. With layer 3, we are now beginning to garner some depth. Most of the terms in this layer will not be familiar to the average person, though a few terms have broken out into the mainstream. However, from here, the foundation is beginning to have solid ground as we go deeper down the rabbit hole. With that, let's get started. Penis envy refers to a specific strain of magic mushrooms that stem from the psilocybe cubensis shroom family. It is a unique variety that is known for its potency and intense psychedelic effects. The name penis envy comes from the appearance of the mushrooms resembling a human penis. This strain is known to produce stronger highs, more powerful hallucinations, and an intense euphoric effect, making it desirable in the psychedelic world. Soma is a term that has been associated with the ancient Vedic ritual drink, which was believed to bestow health, strength, insight, and spiritual visionary experience. It is also referred to as the nectar of the gods and was used in religious ceremonies. The exact nature of the Soma drink has been the subject of debate, with some researchers suggesting that it may have been made from psychoactive mushrooms or a combination of plants. The drink is often linked to the concept of immortality and is thought to have played a significant role in the origins of religious experience and spirituality. LSD, you decide, is an obscure government PSA on the dangers of psychedelic drugs from the 1960s. It attempts to present both sides of the argument, ending the video with the line, you decide, despite having an obvious bias. The phrase, just boof it, is a play on the Nike slogan, just do it. However, in this context, boof is a slang term that refers to a method of ingesting drugs rectally. This method involves inserting drugs, usually in powdered or dissolved form, into the rectum for absorption through the rectal mucosa. The term brown sugar MDMA likely refers to a form of MDMA, 3,4-methylenedioxymethamphetamine, that has a brown or tan color. The color of MDMA can vary based on factors such as impurities, synthesis methods, and the presence of other compounds. While MDMA is often found in the form of a white crystalline powder or crystalline chunks, impurities or additional substances used in its production can result in a brown or tan color. The brown color in most MDMA and MDA on the black market is due to failure to wash out unreacted precursor such as safrol, isosafrol, and products of side reactions. 25i NBOME, often referred to simply as 25i, is a synthetic hallucinogenic substance that belongs to the NBOME and methoxybenzyl class of drugs. It is chemically related to the 2C family of phenethylamines, which include psychedelic compounds like 2CB and 2CI. 25I NBOM gained popularity as a designer drug and is known for its potent hallucinogenic effects. 25I is a potent hallucinogen and its effects are similar to those of LSD and other psychedelic substances. 25I has a narrow therapeutic window meaning that the difference between a standard dose and a potentially dangerous or toxic dose is small. This increases the risk of accidental overdose, which can lead to severe and adverse reactions. There have been cases where 25i has been misrepresented as LSD or other hallucinogens, leading to unintended and potentially harmful effects for users who may not be aware of what they are ingesting. Pikal and Tikal come from Pikal, a chemical love story. It is a book by Dr. Alexander Shulgin and Ann Shulgin, published in 1991. The main title, PICAL, is an acronym that stands for Phenethylamines I Have Known and Loved. The book is divided into two parts. The first part is a fictionalized autobiography of the couple. This part of the book is about two people named Shura and Alice who fall in love. They go through many experiences with the psychedelic compounds that Shura has discovered and has made in his lab, all of which have been bioassayed himself. 
The second part describes 179 different psychedelic compounds, most of which Shulgin discovered himself, including detailed synthesis instructions, bioassays, dosages, and other commentary. For each substance, there is information on its synthesis, suggested effective dosage, duration, and detailed commentary on the subjective effects that were experienced. The book gives details of their research and investigations into the use of psychedelic drugs for the study of the human mind. Altered state experiences are explored in the context of intimacy. Through Piakal, Shulgin sought to ensure that his discoveries would escape the limits of professional research labs and find their way to the public. The MDMA synthesis published in Piakal remains one of the most common clandestine methods of its manufacture to this day. Tikal. The continuation is the sequel to Piakal, published in 1997. The title, Tikal, is an acronym that stands for Tryptamines I Have Known and Loved. The book is also divided into two parts. The first part begins picking up where the similar section of Pikal left off. It then continues with a collection of essays on topics ranging from psychotherapy and the Jungian mind to the prevalence of DMT in nature, ayahuasca, the war on drugs, and even the Big Bang. The second part of Tai Call is a synthesis manual for 55 psychedelic compounds many discovered by Alexander Shulgin himself, including their chemical structures, dosage recommendations, and qualitative comments. The Shulgins were motivated to release the synthesis information as a way to protect the public's access to information about psychedelic compounds. The book provides a blend of biography, botanical facts, scientific speculation, and psychological and political commentary. The phrase, hand in the air, is from the, the book, Pico, A Chemical Love Story, by Alexander and Ann Shulgin. It was used during their research sessions involving psychedelic substances. When someone said, hand in the air, while raising their hand during a trip, it meant that they wanted to discuss a serious reality-based concern or problem. For example, if they smelled smoke. This phrase was always accompanied by an actual raising of the speaker's hand. It was one of the rules established to ensure the safety and clarity of communication during these sessions. Blue honey is a term used to describe honey that has been infused with psilocybin, a psychedelic compound found in certain types of mushrooms. This infusion process results in a sweet, edible product that contains the psychedelic properties of the mushrooms. The name blue honey can be somewhat misleading. While the honey can sometimes turn blue due to the oxidation of psilocybin when the mushrooms are cut, this is not always the case. In fact, it's generally best to limit oxidation as much as possible, as it can degrade the psilocybin and reduce the overall strength of the honey. One of the main benefits of blue honey is its longevity. Honey acts as a natural preservative, so blue honey can potentially last indefinitely if stored properly. This makes it an excellent method for storing psilocybin mushrooms long term. Additionally, the honey can help mask the earthy taste of the mushrooms, making consumption more enjoyable. A museum dose is a term used in the context of psychedelic substances, particularly psilocybin mushrooms. It refers to a medium dose of about 2.0-3.0 grams. This dosage is likely to produce psychedelic effects, but the user will still be able to walk around and maintain a sense of who they are. The term museum dose comes from the idea that a person on this dose could potentially go to a museum without drawing attention to themselves. They would be able to enjoy enhanced experiences, such as heightened sensory perception and introspective thoughts while still being able to interact normally with others and the outside world. Casey William Hardison, born 1971, is an American chemist who was convicted in the United Kingdom in 2005 of six offenses involving psychedelic drugs, three of production, two of possession, and one of exportation. He was born in Washington State in the summer of 1971 Hardison is committed to the entheogenic use of psychedelic substances, 
In 2000, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies published in its bulletin, Hardison's, an amateur qualitative study of 48 2C T7 subjective bioassays. According to Hardison, 2C T7 is a fairly novel entheogenic compound that has been used in a limited context as an adjunct in psychedelic psychotherapy since 1986. After moving to Brighton, Hardison illegally manufactured three Class A drugs, 2CB, DMT, and LSD. He used 38,386 British pounds worth of chemical ingredients to produce hallucinogenic tablets with a street value of up to 5 million pounds. In July 2003, Hardison sent two packages to the U.S. During a random inspection at the FedEx hub in Memphis, Tennessee, officials found four bags of MDMA hidden between pages of a magazine. Thus alerted, British authorities monitored Hardison until arresting him near Brighton in February 2004. In March 2005, after a 10-week trial at Lewis Crown Court, the jury found Hardison guilty. In April 2005, Hardison was sentenced to 20 years imprisonment in the UK with a recommendation that he be deported upon his release. Hardison is also known for his activism. The Drug Equality Alliance, a non-profit organization working to secure equal rights and protections for drug users, was set up by lawyer Daryl Bickler inspired by Hardison's legal arguments. Huachuma is more commonly known as San Pedro in the Western world, or scientifically known as Echinopsis pachinoi. It is a tall, light green, nearly spineless, columnar cactus native to the Andes Mountains. This cactus is found in parts of Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina, but is also cultivated in neighboring countries and many other parts of the world. Huachuma has been used for around 3,500 years by indigenous groups in Peru for spiritual ceremonies. The earliest known use comes from a stone carving, which dates back around 1300 BC. It very clearly depicts a Huachuma shaman holding a tall San Pedro cactus. Like other psychotropic cacti, Huachuma contains several psychoactive alkaloids, the primary one being mescaline. When ingested, Huachuma is usually described as the gentler of the two, but its effects can be felt a little bit longer than that of peyote. The effects of peyote can be felt about 10 to 12 hours, while Huachuma can last between 12 to 14 hours or more, depending on dosage. Ehrlich's reagent, also known as Ehrlich reagent, is a reagent containing p-dimethylaminobenzaldehyde, DMAB, and can act as an indicator to presumptively identify indoles and urobilinogen. Several Ehrlich tests use the reagent in a medical test. Some are drug tests, and others contribute to the diagnosis of various diseases or adverse drug reactions. For example, Ehrlich's reagent can be used to test for the presence of LSD. Upon reaction, the Ehrlich's reagent turns to purple indicating the presence of LSD. Ehrlich reagent can also be used to detect urobilinogen, which can indicate jaundice or other liver-related issues. A very common Ehrlich test is a simple spot test to identify possible psychoactive compounds such as tryptamines like DMT and lysergamides like LSD. It gives a negative test result for 25i and Biomi and many other non-indole-related psychoactives. The reagent is prepared by dissolving 0.5 to 2.0 grams of p-dimethylaminobenzaldehyde, DMEB, in 50 milli liters of 95% ethanol and 50 milliliters of concentrated hydrochloric acid. It is best used when fresh. Other alcohols, such as 1-propanol, can also be used. The Qualia Research Institute, QRI, is a nonprofit organization based in California dedicated to advancing our understanding of consciousness. The Institute was founded in 2018. The main objectives of QRI are to develop a precise mathematical language for describing subjective experience, understand the nature of emotional violence, map out the full space of possible conscious experiences, 
build technologies to improve the lives of sentient beings. QRI conducts rigorous research and theoretical insights directed towards mapping the state space of conscious experience. They maintain a collaborative community of researchers and thinkers, all dedicated to creating technologies that improve the well-being of sentient beings. Some of their featured research includes healing trauma with neural annealing. Is annealing the key condition for successful psychedelic psychotherapy? Digital sentience and the binding boundary problem. Digital computers may remain unconscious until they recruit physical fields for holistic computing using well-defined topological boundaries. Hyperbolic geometry of DMT and analysis of the phenomenology of DMT with algorithmic, geometric, and information theoretic frameworks. Logarithmic, scales of pleasure and pain, rating, ranking, and comparing Peak experiences suggest the existence of long tails for pleasure and pain. Pseudo time, arrow, explaining phenomenal time with implicit causal structures in networks of local binding. Symmetry, theory of valence, Michael Johnson's hypothesis that if an experience can be represented by a mathematical object, then the symmetry of that object corresponds with its hedonic tone. They also provide resources such as a guided meditation series called Qualia Mastery and a guide for writing useful trip reports that focus on the phenomenal character of experiences. The phrase, measure with your heart, is often used in the context of cooking or preparing something where precise measurements are not strictly necessary. It suggests that one should use their intuition and personal preference to determine the right amount of an ingredient or component. This phrase emphasizes the importance of personal touch and love in the creation process. It's about feeling the process rather than strictly adhering to the measurements. In regard to psychedelics, it essentially means to feel out your doses, though in previous layers, it has been established that eyeing out doses can be very risky. Seeking the Magic Mushroom is a 1957 photo essay by amateur mycologist Robert Gordon Wasson. The essay describes Wasson's experience taking psilocybin mushrooms in 1955 during a Mazatec ritual in Oaxaca, Mexico. Wasson was one of the first Westerners to participate in a Mazatec ceremony and to describe the psychoactive effects of the psilocybe species. The essay contains photographs by Alan Richardson and illustrations of several mushroom species of psilocybe collected and identified by French botanist Roger Heim, then director of the French National Museum of Natural History. Wasson's essay, written in a first-person narrative, appeared in the May 13th issue of Life magazine as part three of the Great Adventures series. The essay was part of three related works about mushrooms released around the same time period. It was preceded by the limited release of Mushrooms, Russia, and History, a two-volume book by Wasson and his wife, Valentina Pavlovna Wasson. The Life magazine essay was followed six days later by I Ate the Sacred Mushroom, an interview with Valentina in This Week magazine. Against Wasson's wishes, a Life magazine editor added the term Magic Mushroom to the title and brought its use into popular culture which is still used today. The essay influenced the nascent counterculture in the United States and led many hippies to travel to Mexico in the 1960s in search of the mushroom, including Timothy Leary. In the 1970s, Wasson expressed misgivings about the wide publicity the essay brought to the Mazatec culture and the defilement of the mushroom ritual. Dieta refers to plant diets that are a fundamental and highly flexible technique with a variety of uses. These uses range from treating and preventing illness to increasing strength and resilience, to rites of passage, and even to learning medicine itself. Many of the plants used in diets are psychoactive. The dieta is often performed before traditional psychedelic traditions, such as partaking of ayahuasca. The dieta is a period of isolation during which the dieter abstains from certain foods and behaviors. This includes avoiding salt, 
Suger, oil, fat, spicy foods, sex, and any form of excitement. The purpose of this is to clean to the body and to create a space in which the plant spirits can work more effectively. The dieta is seen as a time of sacrifice where one gives up worldly pleasures to gain spiritual ones. It is a time of introspection and connection with nature. The dieter often consumes a tea made from the plant they are dieting. And this plant is seen as a teacher imparting wisdom and healing. It's important to note that the dieta is a serious undertaking and should be approached with respect and under the guidance of a knowledgeable guide or shaman. The effects can be powerful and transformative, but they can also be challenging, and it's important to be prepared both physically and mentally. The Acid King is a term that has been used to refer to two different individuals. First one is William Leonard Pickard. Born on October 21st, 1945, Pickard is an American writer, researcher, and convicted drug trafficker. He is one of two people convicted in the largest LSD manufacturing case in history. In 2000, while moving their LSD laboratory across Kansas, Pickard and Clyde Apperson were pulled over while driving a rider rental truck and a follow car. The laboratory had been stored near a renovated Atlas E missile silo near Wamago, Kansas. On July 27, 2020, Pickard was granted compassionate release from federal prison 20 years into his sentence. Prior to his arrest, Pickard was deputy director of the Drug Policy Research Program at the University of California, Los Angeles. He came from a well-to-do family. His father was a lawyer and his stepmother was a fungal disease expert at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Second is Richard Allen Casso Jr., also known as the Acid King. Casso was an American murderer who killed his 17-year-old friend, Gary Lowers, in Northport, New York, on June 19, 1984. Two other teens, Jimmy Troiano and Albert Quinones, were present at the murder, which took place in the Aztakia woods of Northport, while all four were under the influence of what they believed to be mescaline, but was most likely LSD. The murder became sensational news in New York City and across the nation due to the alleged torture of Lowers and supposed occult aspects of the murder. The murder took place during a period known as the Satanic Panic, when there was much public concern over the effects of Satanic and occult content in heavy metal music and in role-playing games. Casso was wearing an ACDC t-shirt at the time of his arrest and was a fan of groups such as Black Sabbath, Judas Priest, and Ozzy Osbourne. Five grams in silent darkness is a method of consuming psilocybin mushrooms that was popularized by Terence McKenna. The method involves taking a dose of five grams of dried psilocybin mushrooms, then sitting in a completely dark and quiet environment. The idea behind this method is to eliminate as much external stimulation as possible allowing the individual to focus entirely on their internal experience. This can lead to intense and profound psychedelic experiences. Here is an excerpt from a trip report about what such as experience is like. I was following Terence's advice of looking at the back of your eyelids with the expectation of seeing something. The streaming started within 15 minutes and began to accelerate very quickly. I reminded myself to trust the mushroom and that I was safe. The visuals behind my eyelids were accelerating with intensity and constantly morphing. They kind of had a DMT feel to them, if that makes sense. I let go and allowed the experience to take over. I heard a female voice telling me, we're going to be fixing and healing your brain tonight, in plain English. The mushroom told me, the antidote to negativity is gratitude. The mushroom told me, the meaning of life summed up in one word is love. It told me to cry, to release negativity, and not have anger build up in my life. I had moments where the mushroom got stern with me. At one point, it said, you say you're depressed, so let me see your pain. Cry. Show me the pain you claim to have experienced in your life. 
It felt like I tapped into something in my brain, and I bawled and bawled harder than I ever have in my life. It truly felt like I was purging negativity. The mushroom reiterated the importance of crying as a release. I felt pure, unconditional love from this female entity voice that told me to take action at working on my stubbornness. And she could tell I'd be back again soon. I definitely got Terence's point about how the mushroom raves. The mushroom even walked me through old memories I hadn't thought about since they happened. This was by far the most meaningful experience in my life, and I've been making significant changes for the better since the experience. In layer three, we have sacred geometry again. Going deeper into this topic are a few things. One is the interesting link between sacred geometry and psychedelics, such as DMT. The Qualia Research Institute has proposed a hypothesis that the network of subjective measurements of distances we experience on DMT, coming from the relationships between the phenomenal objects one experiences in that state, has an overall geometry that can accurately be described as hyperbolic. This means that the perceived space within the DMT experience might be non-Euclidean, and the complex geometric patterns often reported are a manifestation of this. One of the biggest contributors to modern scientific research into sacred geometry is Randall Carlson, a master builder, architectural designer, teacher, geometrician, geomythologist, geological explorer, and renegade scholar who has dedicated his life to the study of sacred geometry. He believes that sacred geometry synthesizes both intuitive and intellectual aspects of geometry into an integrated whole. In his lectures, Carlson explains the connection between catastrophic events and cosmological cycles, such as the precession of the equinox from the perspective of sacred geometry. He suggests that the operations of sacred geometry recapitulate and symbolize the primordial process of cosmic manifestation, both internal and external. In one of his lectures, Carlson explains the geometric design and cosmic origin of DNA, the macromolecule of life. He shows how DNA is composed of pentagonal and hexagonal rings that bond according to two types of chemical bonds and how these rings are found in meteorites, suggesting that life came from space. He also discusses the role of the divine proportion or golden section in the evolution of life. His research is also beginning to lead engineers into new engineering principles which are revolutionizing technology. One such device is a new energy source for combustion engines called a thunderstorm generator invented by Malcolm Bendall. The thunderstorm generator is a device that utilizes plasmoids to convert carbon emissions into oxygen and energy. By ionizing air that bubbles through water, plasmoid bubbles are formed, which under compression will ignite. Prototypes of this plasmoid water generator are already being used to replace gasoline in generators and cars. Large car companies and even Caterpillar Inc. are looking into the generator as an alternative to fossil fuels. In one of the Malcolm Bendall's lectures, available on Randall Carlson's website, Bendall explains how the thunderstorm generator works and mentions the influence of sacred geometry on its design. Essentially, there is a growing argument that sacred geometry is a mathematical encoding of the nature of our planet, the universe, physics, history, and quite possibly, the blueprints to ancient technologies lost to the sands of time. The phrase Hoffman microdosed refers to Albert Hoffman, the Swiss chemist who first synthesized LSD, who had some interesting insights on microdosing. Hoffman considered microdosing one of the most promising applications of LSD. He was among the first to realize its potential for enhancing cognition and acting as an antidepressant. Hoffman himself is reported to have microdosed LSD. He famously took between 10 and 20 milligrams of LSD twice a week for the last few decades of his life. He died at the age of 102, microdosing even through his old age. Hoffman suggested that very small doses 
perhaps 25 micrograms, could be useful as a euphoriant or antidepressant. However, he also acknowledged that LSD could be dangerous if misused, especially if a relatively high dose of 500 micrograms is administered to a first-time user without adequate supervision. Before his death in 2008, Hoffman spoke with Dr. Rick Doblin, the founder of the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, MAPS, indicating that the most crucial aspect of future research on psychedelics would involve microdosing. The Wizard of Oz suggests that The Wizard of Oz is an allegory for a psychedelic trip. The film's transition from black and white to vibrant technicolor upon Dorothy's arrival in Oz is often interpreted as a psychedelic experience. The surreal elements of the story, such as flying monkeys and talking scarecrows, further contribute to this interpretation. The film's re-emergence during the counterculture movement of the 1960s, a time when psychedelic substances like LSD were widely used, has led some to view it as a psychedelic odyssey. There's a popular urban legend known as Dark Side of the Rainbow, which suggests that the 1973 Pink Floyd album, The Dark Side of the Moon, synchronizes with the visuals of The Wizard of Oz when played simultaneously. Some fans interpret this as evidence of the film's psychedelic undertones. Some viewers report that their personal experiences with psychedelics resonate with the fantastical and dreamlike elements of the film. However, a lot of the strangeness of Wizard of Oz comes from the writer. L. Frank Baum, the author of The Wizard of Oz, was a member of the Theosophical Society. This organization is based on occult research and the comparative study of religions. Baum's interest in theosophy is not widely known, but it was significant. Baum and his wife, Maud, both applied for membership in the Theosophical Society on September 4, 1892. Baum's son, Frank, admitted that his father was interested in theosophy, but also reported that Baum could not accept all its teachings. Baum firmly believed in reincarnation and had faith in the immortality of the soul. He believed that he and his wife had been together in many past states and would be together in future reincarnations. However, he did not accept the possibility of the transmigration of souls from human beings to animals or vice versa, as in Hinduism. He agreed with the theosophical belief that man on earth was only one step on a great ladder that passed through many states of consciousness, through many universes, to a final state of enlightenment. He also believed in karma, the concept that whatever good or evil one does in his lifetime returns to him as reward or punishment in future reincarnations. PMA can refer to a couple different things. The PMA, or Psychedelic Medicine Association, is a society of physicians, therapists, and healthcare professionals that aims to advance their education on the therapeutic uses of psychedelic medicines. They provide education and informational tools to help healthcare professionals feel confident discussing psychedelic medicines with their patients. They offer courses such as managing medical risk in patients seeking psilocybin therapy designed to provide healthcare professionals with the tools they need to safely, effectively, and comfortably assess and discuss the relevant medical risks of psilocybin therapy with their patients. PMA, also known as paramethoxyamphetamine, is a designer drug of the amphetamine class with serotonergic effects. Unlike other similar drugs of this family, PMA does not produce stimulant, euphoriant, or intactogen effects and behaves more like an antidepressant in comparison, though it does have some psychedelic properties. Effects of PMA ingestion include many effects of the hallucinogenic amphetamines, including accelerated and irregular heartbeat, blurred vision, and a strong feeling of intoxication that is often unpleasant. At high doses, unpleasant effects such as nausea and vomiting, severe hyperthermia, and hallucinations may occur. PMA is often sold as MDMA, leading to people unwittingly taking it, thinking it's ecstasy. This misrepresentation is dangerous for a number of reasons, 
PMA in low doses can have effects that are superficially similar to MDMA. However, PMA is more toxic than MDMA, meaning you need to take less of it to have an adverse reaction. PMA takes longer to have an effect than MDMA does. Seasoned ecstasy users used to the effects of MDMA will know how long a pill usually takes to have an effect. If their pill, even if bought from someone they trust, could be cut with any number of things which might make it less potent. So when a usual reaction hasn't occurred after a typical time, the user might assume the batch is weak and take more. If it's actually PMA, this can be very dangerous. PMA is toxic at a much lower dose than MDMA. The dose response curve is very steep, meaning that consuming only slightly more than the amount needed to achieve the high a user wants can be enough to elicit the toxic effects, making accidentally overdosing easy to do. The pineal gland, also known as the pineal body or epiphysis cerebri, is a small endocrine gland located in the brain of most vertebrates. It's situated beneath the back part of the corpus callosum. The gland is shaped like a tiny pine cone, which is how it got its name. According to accepted science, the primary function of the pineal gland is to secrete the hormone melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone that's mainly produced by your pineal gland. The importance of pineal melatonin in humans is not clear, but many researchers believe it may help to synchronize circadian rhythms in different parts of your body. Some researchers argue that the pineal gland may produce DMT. This idea was popularized by clinical psychiatrist Rick Strassman in his book, DMT, The Spirit Molecule. He proposed that the pineal gland produces enough DMT to produce psychoactive effects upon death, potentially explaining near-death experiences. Some spiritual researchers suggest that when a person dies, DMT is released in large quantities by the pineal gland to help the soul leave the body easier and return to higher dimensions. The pineal gland is often associated with the third eye or the seat of enlightenment in many cultures and religions. It's believed that this gland is our connection between the physical and spiritual world. In Egyptology, the pineal gland is often associated with the Eye of Horus or the Eye of Ra, which are important symbols in ancient Egyptian culture. These symbols are thought to represent the third eye or a higher state of consciousness. The Eye of Horus and the Eye of Ra are often depicted in the center of the forehead on sarcophagi, similar to the location of the pineal gland in the human brain. The pineal gland is also linked to the concept of the third eye in Hinduism. Deities like Shiva are often depicted with a literal third eye on their forehead, symbolizing enlightenment and the ability to perceive higher realms of existence. The pineal gland has even been represented in modern religions. The Pope's staff, known as the Ferula, has been noted to have a pine cone. The Fontana della Pina, located at the Vatican, resembles a large pine cone. It is a former Roman fountain, now decorating a vast niche in the wall of the Vatican. It originally stood near the Pantheon, next to the Temple of Isis, before it was relocated. Ketamine therapy is a treatment approach that uses doses of ketamine, a dissociative anesthetic medication, to manage various mental health conditions. It's been found effective in combating treatment-resistant depression, PTSD, and anxiety. Ketamine got its start in Belgium in the 1960s as an anesthesia medicine for animals and was approved as an anesthetic for people in 1970. It was used in treating injured soldiers on the battlefields in the Vietnam War. Some doctors also use ketamine to treat suicidal thoughts. Ketamine causes what doctors call a dissociative experience and what most anyone else would call a trip. This trip lasts about one and a half to two hours. Ketamine is thought to affect the glutamate neurotransmitter in the brain, improving neuroplasticity and interrupting ruminative patterns such as those found with depression. 
ketamine therapy entails an intake session with a therapist, then several sessions in which ketamine is administered, then integration and follow-up meetings with a therapist. Ketamine can be administered through nasal sprays, orally via lozenges, intramuscular injections, or intravenous infusions. As a side note, I personally can vouch for this treatment method as it really helped me through some PTSD and depression I experienced. The phrase guy who injected magic mushrooms refers to a case where a 30-year-old man with bipolar disorder injected himself with a tea made from magic mushrooms. The man had stopped taking his prescribed medications and was experiencing manic and depressive episodes. He had read about the potential therapeutic effects of psilocybin, the active compound in magic mushrooms, for treating symptoms of depression and anxiety. To administer the psilocybin, the man boiled the mushrooms in water, filtered the liquid through a cotton swab, and then injected the substance into his bloodstream. A few days later, he began to feel extremely tired, vomited blood, and developed jaundice, diarrhea, and nausea. His family noticed his confusion and rushed him to a Nebraska hospital. Upon arrival at the hospital, doctors found that his liver was damaged, his kidneys were not functioning properly, and he was on the verge of organ failure. A blood test revealed an even more shocking discovery. The mushrooms he had injected were now growing in his bloodstream. The man was put on a ventilator to assist his breathing and was given antibiotics and antifungals to eliminate the fungal growth. He spent a total of 22 days in the hospital with eight of those days in the intensive care unit where he received treatment for multi-system organ failure. He will remain on long-term antifungal and antibiotic treatment. The moral of the story, if you're going to experiment with psychedelic substances, maybe stick to the traditional methods of consumption. Jedi Flip refers to the act of combining MDMA, LSD, and psilocybin. This combination is known for delivering intense psychedelic experiences that are stronger than taking LSD or psilocybin alone. The term Jedi implies a certain level of mastery over the psychedelic experience, as this combination can be quite intense. Some users report experiencing the best aspects of all three substances, the mind expansion of psilocybin, the vividness of LSD, and the positive attitude of MDMA. However, the effects can vary greatly depending on factors such as dosage, individual metabolic factors, personal experience, and the environment in which the substances are taken. It's important to note that combining these substances can be incredibly risky and can have severe consequences, including death. Therefore, it's strongly advised not to attempt this without proper knowledge and understanding of the potential risks involved. Based on trip reports, Jedi flipping is often described as one of the most powerful psychedelic encounters. A significant number of users express feeling swamped, with many accounts detailing severe nausea and vomiting. Psilocybin, which can frequently induce nausea on its own, is likely the cause in these instances. While some individuals assert that they experience each drug separately during a Jedi flip, the majority liken the experience to a potent MDMA trip, but with additional visuals. MDMA acts as an enhancer to the effects of the mushrooms and LSD. Users of MDMA often report a heightened sense of connection to the world, along with enhanced visual and auditory perception. This effect is mirrored during a Jedi flip, intensifying the hallucinations induced by the mushrooms and LSD and amplifying the user's emotional depth and self-reflection. Embedded geometry is a concept in mathematics where one shape or structure is placed within another. This is similar to how a smaller square can fit inside a larger square, or how a line can be drawn within a plane. The key point is that the smaller shape retains its properties even when it's placed within the larger shape. For example, the smaller square is still a square with all its sides equal, and the line still has its length and direction even when they're inside the larger shapes. In more advanced mathematics, this concept is used to study complex shapes and structures. For example, a sphere 
like a basketball, can be embedded in three-dimensional space, or a line, like a number line, can be embedded in two-dimensional space, like a plane. The term embedding is also used in other areas of mathematics. For example, in graph theory, a graph, a network of points and lines, can be embedded in a plane so that no lines cross each other. To simplify the concept, let's imagine you have a small toy car and a big sandbox. You can place your toy car anywhere in the sandbox. That's like embedding. The toy car is a smaller object, like a number, shape, or even a concept. And the sandbox is a larger space, like a line, plane, or even a more complex mathematical space. When you place your toy car in the sandbox, it still remains the same toy car. It doesn't change its shape or color. It just exists in a different place. That's what mathematicians mean when they say an embedding preserves structure. Now in the context of psychedelics, refers to the changes in the perception of space and time that occur under the influence of psychedelic substances. This is often described in terms of changes to the geometry of one's perceptual field. One theory posits that the network of subjective measurements of distances we experience on DMT has an overall geometry that can accurately be described as hyperbolic. In other words, our inner 3D space plus time world grows larger than is possible to fit in an experiential field with 3D Euclidean phenomenal space. This results in phenomenal spaces, surfaces, and objects acquiring a mean negative curvature. Psychedelic art usually include features that can be interpreted as hyperbolic objects embedded in Euclidean 3D. People describe incredibly advanced mechanisms and impossible objects that cannot be represented in our usual reality. To break it down in simpler ways, imagine you're playing a video game with 3D graphics. Normally, you can move forward, backward, left, right, up, and down. That's like our normal world. But when someone takes a psychedelic, it's like they're playing a game with extra dimensions or rules that don't exist in our normal world. For example, they might feel like they can move in directions that aren't possible in our world, like moving through time or seeing objects that can't exist in our 3D world. This is what we mean by embedded geometry. Esketamine. Schedule 2 is likely a typo, intended to be Schedule 3. In my research, there were several articles which would mislabel esketamine as Schedule 2 instead of 3. Throughout all of this substance's history, it has always been Schedule 3, which is less regulated than Schedule 2, leading me to believe it is just a common mistake, which keeps getting repeated. This being said, esketamine is the S enantiomer of ketamine. While ketamine was first approved by the FDA in 1970, Spravato represents the first FDA approval of esketamine for any use. Esketamine, marketed under the brand name Spravato, is a nasal spray medication that was approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for the treatment of adults with treatment-resistant depression. The FDA approval was granted on March 5, 2019. Esketamine is used in conjunction with an oral antidepressant for adults who have tried other antidepressant medicines but have not benefited from them. This condition is known as treatment-resistant depression due to the risk of serious adverse outcomes resulting from sedation and dissociation caused by Spravato administration and the potential for abuse and misuse of the drug. It is only available through a restricted distribution system, under a risk evaluation and mitigation strategy. Patients self-administer Spravato nasal spray under the supervision of a healthcare provider in a certified doctor's office or clinic, and the spray cannot be taken home. The healthcare provider monitors the patient for at least two hours after receiving their Spravato dose. The REMS requires the prescriber and the patient to both sign a patient enrollment form that clearly states that the patient understands they should make arrangements 
to safely leave the healthcare setting to get home and that the patient should not drive or use heavy machinery for the rest of the day on which they received the drug. The FDA's progressive stance towards the therapeutic use of psychedelics, as exemplified by the approval of escitamine, is a significant development in the field of mental health. Toad venom endangered likely refers to the conservation status of a certain toad species whose venom contains psychoactive compounds. The Colorado Rivery Toad, also known as the Sonoran Desert Toad, or scientifically as Encilius alvarius, is one of the largest toad species found in North America. It secretes a venom that contains a high concentration of 5-MeO-DMT, one of the most potent psychedelics on Earth. This toad is thought to be extinct in California and endangered in New Mexico, mainly due to overcollection. The venom is often collected by milking the toads or removing the skin on the back where the glands are located. The possession of this toad's venom is illegal in California. In the United States, the Colorado River toad is found in the lower Colorado River and the Gila River catchment areas in extreme southwestern New Mexico and much of southern Arizona. It is considered possibly extirpated from California. In Mexico, the toad is found in the states of Sonora, Sinaloa, and Chihuahua. It lives in both desert and semi-arid areas throughout its range. It is semi-aquatic and is often found in streams near springs, in canals and drainage ditches, and under water troughs. The toxin is typically extracted from the toad's glands and dried into a paste, which is then smoked. One single 50 milligram vaporized dose often produces hallucinogenic, boundless experiences within one second of inhalation that can last from seven to 90 minutes, and on average, last 20 minutes. During this time, users have reported feeling a profound sense of connectedness, joy, and peace. Some describe the experience as indescribable, while others characterize the trip as a feeling of awareness, being connected to a higher power, and feeling reborn. Joe Rogan famously described his experience on this substance as ceasing to exist in a mass of pixelated gray. After the trip, users are left with an altered mood and perception. Some users even report making major life changes because of their new outlook. Due to the popularity of the venom, the toads have been aggressively hunted in recent years, leading to a declining population for an already endangered species. Blue Mondays is a term often used to describe the come down or hangover experienced after the use of MDMA. The Blue Mondays effect is believed to occur because MDMA induces a large release of serotonin in the brain, a neurotransmitter that helps regulate mood and feelings of well-being. After the effects of the drug wear off, it's thought that the brain may be temporarily depleted of serotonin, leading to feelings of depression, fatigue, and other negative symptoms. However, not everyone who takes MDMA will experience a come down or hangover, and the severity can depend on various factors, such as the dose taken, the purity of the drug, sleep deprivation, and whether the drug was combined with alcohol or other substances. Losing the magic is a term often used in the context of drug use, particularly with substances like MDMA. It refers to the phenomenon where after repeated use of a drug, the user no longer experiences the same effects or high that they once did. This can happen for a variety of reasons. One explanation is that the brain's receptors become less responsive or fried due to frequent stimulation, leading to increased tolerance. Another theory suggests that the loss of magic is a combination of chronic tolerance and loss of novelty, with both physiological and psychological components. In the case of MDMA, the magic is often described as a warm, euphoric feeling, a sense of connectedness and heightened sensory perception. When the magic is lost, Users may still feel some effects, but they're not as intense or enjoyable as they once were. This often leads users to chase the early high.
by increasing dosage, which leads to detrimental effects. Uncle Ben's refers to a popular method for growing psilocybin mushrooms, known as the Uncle Ben's Tech, or Ready Rice Tech. This technique involves using pre-cooked and packaged rice, like Uncle Ben's Ready Rice, as a substrate for the mushroom spores to grow on. Here's a simplified overview of the process. Inject the mushroom spores into the Uncle Ben's rice bag. Allow the spores to colonize the rice, which takes about a month. During this time, the spores germinate and begin producing mycelium, a network of white tendrils that colonize the substrate from the inside. After the bag is completely colonized, mix the colonized rice with a bulk substrate like coco coir, a type of dirt. The mycelium will then colonize this new substrate. After about a week, mist the substrate with water and provide it with fresh air. Mushrooms will start growing. This method is popular because it's relatively simple and doesn't require a pressure cooker or other specialized equipment. DMT Breakthrough is the holy grail of psychedelic experiences. A breakthrough is a profound and intense experience that occurs when a sufficient amount of DMT is consumed. It's often described as an encounter with an unbelievably powerful, sentient, intelligent force. The breakthrough experience is often described as entering an alternate reality or dimension. This new reality is internally simulated and feels incredibly real and meaningful. It's often accompanied by strong emotional reactions and effects in the body. Many users report encountering beings or entities that communicate with them. These encounters can be so intense and realistic that they defy our normal way of thinking. A study found that during a DMT breakthrough, there are large decreases in higher frequency alpha waves and big increases in the low frequency delta and theta waves. These effects were strongly related to the visual imagery or hallucinations induced by the compound. These changes in brain activity may help create an extremely realistic new reality. The effects on brain waves during a DMT breakthrough are similar to what we see when people are dreaming. This might explain why the experiences feel so real. Despite its intensity, a DMT breakthrough is usually brief, much shorter than trips induced by other psychedelics, usually lasting about 15 minutes. This channel has trip reports and information on entities. If you want to dive more into the world of DMT breakthroughs, Leo Zeff, May 14, 1912 to April 13, 1988, was an American psychologist and psychotherapist based in Oakland, California. He is known for pioneering the use of LSD, MDMA, and other psychoactive drugs in psychotherapy during the 1970s. In 1977, when Alexander Shulgin introduced Zeph to MDMA, the drug was still legal. Zeph popularized it in the psychotherapeutic community, dubbing it Adam because he believed it returned one to a state of primordial innocence. Zeph was introduced to LSD in 1961 when he was working as a Jungian therapist, and he developed a method for administering LSD to patients during psychotherapy. He worked with carefully screened patients only, and the major aim of the first session involved finding the patient's correct LSD dose. Prior to working with psychedelics, Leo Zeff had been a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army. His contributions to psychedelic therapy and mentorship towards the study of the benefits of using MDMA as an adjunct to psychotherapy had a critical, foundational role in the formation of MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. A revised edition of The Secret Chief Revealed, Conversations with Leo Zeff, pioneer in the underground psychedelic therapy movement, was published on April 19, 2022. The book is an in-depth, first-hand account of Leo Zeff's research, studies, and practice with psychedelic-assisted therapy. The Aztec Combo is an ancient method of consuming psilocybin mushrooms with a cacao drink, traditionally called Xocoatl. This combination has been used by the Aztecs for thousands of years due to their synergistic effects. The traditional name of cacao is derived from the scientific name Theobroma cacao, meaning food or nourishment of the gods. 
the cacao seeds once held so much value that they were used as currency in ancient Mesoamerica. Cacao was used for many different rituals, such as birth, marriage, religious ceremonies, and death. It was also used as medicine. Cacao holds many properties that are beneficial to our health. One known chemical found in cacao is anandamide, a naturally occurring chemical found in the brain that gives a general sense of relaxation, happiness, and bliss. When consumed together, the psychoactive effects of cacao perfectly blend with those of magic mushrooms. A typical ceremony involved roasting and fermenting the cacao beans. The Aztec combo is essentially shroom tea with raw cacao mixed in as one drink. The mushroom tea potentiates the experience and raw cacao is a relatively mild MAY inhibitor. This combination results in a potent and unique psychedelic experience. Although it's an extremely potent trip, it definitely feels different and strays away from most of the familiarity you have with just taking shrooms. You will need 2G of dried fruits, 5G of dried aborts, 1.5 cups of water, and 0.5 cup of raw cacao powder. Bring 1.5 cups of water to a bare simmer, not quite a boil, and maintain this heat for five minutes. While the water is heating, ensure that the fruits are properly cut up. After the five minutes are up, add the aborts and the cut up fruits to the simmering water. Allow the mixture to sit for 20 minutes. Make sure to stir it occasionally, about every five minutes. After the 20 minute period, stir in the cacao powder. A user trip report on this experience reads as follows. The trip didn't really feel like an advanced mushroom trip. It felt like a partly successful DMT trip. If you like DMT and don't mind getting and possibly staying in the tunnel, that aspect will be enticing because unlike a DMT trip, this feeling lasted a good eight hours before sobriety crept in and the come down was evident. Oscar Janiger, February 8, 1918 to August 14, 2001, was an experimental psychiatrist and a University of California Irvine psychiatrist and psychotherapist. He is best known for his research on LSD, which lasted from 1954 to 1962. Janiger was born in New York City and he moved to Los Angeles in 1950, where he set up a private practice and later taught at the University of California at Irvine. As a pioneer advocate of hallucinogens, Janiger introduced LSD to Cary Grant, Aldous Huxley, and other celebrities. He was interested in the relationship between creativity and mind-expanding drugs. He bought the then-legal drugs from a Swiss company, Sandoz Laboratories, and abandoned his research when the U.S. government began investigating researchers in 1962. The drugs were made illegal in 1966. In 1986, he formed the Albert Hoffman Foundation for Psychedelic Research, named after the chemist who first synthesized LSD. Janiger's work predated Timothy Leary's, but was not recognized widely because he did not publish his data. He administered the drugs in his Los Angeles office. He had 900 people take LSD, usually two micrograms per kilogram of body weight, and recorded their experiences. The participants included celebrities, actors, writers, college students, a deputy marshal, housewives, attorneys, clerical assistants, counselors, medical personnel, dentists, physicians, and engineers. The Stamets Stack is a microdosing protocol developed by Paul Stamets, a renowned mycologist. The protocol involves combining three key components. Psilocybin mushrooms are taken in a microdose. The typical dosage is 0.1 to 0.2 grams of dried magic mushrooms. Next is lion's mane mushroom, which is a medicinal mushroom known for its unique nerve regenerative properties. The typical dosage is 500 milligrams to 1000 milligrams of high quality lion's mane extract powder. Lastly, niacin. The typical dosage is 25 to 50 milligrams. Niacin is incorporated in this stack for its potential to more effectively distribute the psilocybin and lion's mane into the brain. 
thereby enhancing the brain-boosting benefits of both substances. The protocol involves a cycle of dosing days and non-dosing days over a six to eight week period. The combination of these substances is believed to enhance cognition and promote neuroregeneration. The claimed benefits of the Stamets Stack microdosing protocol include reduced anxiety and depression, stabilized mood, enhanced creativity, regeneration of visual and auditory neurons, reduced irritability, relief from PTSD symptoms, reduced incidence of neuropathy, increased ability to socialize, empathize, and feel courageous, mediated effects of aging on the brain, enhanced self-awareness, and a greater sense of interconnection. Musimol, also known as agarin or pantherin, is one of the principal psychoactive constituents of Amanita muscaria and related species of mushroom. It is a potent and selective orthosteric agonist for the GABA-A receptor and displays sedative, hypnotic, depressant, and hallucinogenic psychoactivity. Musimol is produced in the mushrooms Amanita muscaria and Amanita pantherina. In A. muscaria, the layer just below the skin of the cap contains the highest amount of musimol. It is also a potent GABA-A agonist, activating the receptor for the brain's principal inhibitory neurotransmitter, GABA. Musimol binds to the same site on the GABA-A receptor complex as GABA itself, as opposed to other GABAergic drugs such as barbiturates and benzodiazepines, which bind to separate regulatory sites. Scientific studies have shown that dosing of the active ingredient muscimol is usually not precise as it has to be extracted from dried Amanita flour. However, a psychoactive dose of muscimol is reported to be between 8 and 15 milligrams. As little as a gram of dried Amanita muscaria budding plant may contain this amount of muscimol. However, the potency varies greatly among mushrooms when consumed a substantial percentage of musimol goes unmetabolized and thus excreted in urine, a phenomenon exploited by practitioners of the traditional entheogenic use of Amanita muscaria. In patients with Huntington's disease and chronic schizophrenia, oral doses of musimol have been found to cause a rise of both prolactin and growth hormone. Musimol went under clinical trial phase I for epilepsy but the trial was discontinued. Recent studies from 2023 show that muscimol was able to significantly alleviate pain in its peak effect. It is, has since been federally banned in review in the United States, but scientists believe it may relieve pain as well as some without much of the risk of addiction associated with opioids. Here's a trip report of this substance. I chowed down on the caps at about 9 p.m. Within an hour, I began to feel intoxicated, extremely similar to alcohol. The feelings of intoxication persisted for about another two hours before I decided to call it a night. As at the time, I thought I hadn't taken enough to have a full-on trip. I went to bed. The next thing I know, I am in an eternal black void. No light, no color, no sound, save my own thoughts. I tried moving only to realize that I could only move in one direction, straight ahead. This immediately brought panic upon me. I tried fighting against the forces keeping me from going in any other direction, but with each failure to diverge from my path, I became increasingly scared and agitated. This went on for what felt like hours. Eventually, I gave in to the void. I accepted my place in the pitch black and what I could only describe as a two-dimensional realm. I accepted that it was my destiny to travel in a straight line until the end of time. With only my thoughts to keep me company, I continued along my path for what seemed to be days, and then I stopped. I had reached the end of the line. A paternal voice, who I dubbed my narrator, began to speak to me, telling me that I would, in fact, be all right. The narrator began giving me simple instructions via, well, narration. 
It was through this that he guided me back into my body, where I awoke in my bed at 3.35 a.m. The term British Army LSD likely refers to a series of experiments conducted by the UK military in the 1960s, where LSD, a powerful hallucinogenic drug, was administered to soldiers. The tests were carried out with volunteers from the Royal Marines at Porton Down, one of the UK's most secretive locations. The aim was to explore non-lethal forms of defense. The effects of the drug became apparent 25 minutes after administration, with the men becoming relaxed and beginning to giggle. An hour and 10 minutes after taking the drug, the troop commander admitted he could no longer control himself or his men. These experiments were considered a success at the time, but the military's experimentation with LSD ended in 1968 with the chairman of the Chemical Defense Advisory Board declaring that the idea of using LSD as a weapon of war was more magical than scientific. Before these field exercises, Porton Down had explored the possibility of administering LSD in interrogations as a truth drug. British servicemen were allegedly asked if they would volunteer to help with research into finding a cure for the common cold. Then, it was later claimed, they were given LSD. There are several documentaries and videos available online that provide more details and even footage from these experiments. In the context of psychedelics, tracers refer to the visual phenomenon where trails are perceived during the movement of moving objects in one's field of vision. It looks akin to setting a digital camera to a very slow shutter speed. This effect is often accompanied by other effects, such as drifting and after images. It is most commonly induced under the influence of mild dosages of psychedelic compounds, such as LSD, psilocybin, and mescaline. The Qualia Research Institute has developed a method for replicating psychedelic tracer effects in detail, the tracer replication tool. This tool provides a window into how the time-like texture of experience determines the state of consciousness. The technique of using the tracer tool may find useful applications, such as allowing us to describe exotic ineffable experiences in clear language, standardize a scale of intensity of psychedelic drug effects, help us quantify the synergy between different drugs, and test theories for what makes an experience feel good or bad. The pilot data collected with this tool so far is suggestive of the following patterns. THC and HPPD result in a smooth and faint trail effect. The characteristic frequencies of the strobe and replay effects for 2CB are slower than those of either DMT or 5-MeO-DMT, whereas DMT comes with a strong color pulsing effect, leading to very colorful visuals. 5-MeO-DMT gives rise to monochromatic tracer effects. 2CB, also known as Nexus, is a synthetic psychoactive substance of the phenethylamine family. It was first produced by Dr. Alexander Shulgin, an American chemist and pharmacologist, in 1974. The chemical properties of 2CB most closely resemble those of mescaline, and it is considered both a hallucinogen and an intactogen. 2CB is often compared to LSD and MDMA, but it's not quite the same as either. It's known for enhancing one's senses and feelings and amplifying visuals, sound, and touch. The visual effects, including hallucinations, can be more intense than those produced by LSD or magic mushrooms. Not much is known about the pharmacodynamics of 2CB, but it shows a binding affinity for the 5-HT2 serotonergic receptors. Unlike the classical psychedelics, it selectively antagonizes the 5-HT2A receptor, subtype usually involved in hallucinogenic effects. Its psychoactivity is thought to be at least partially related to the activation of 5-DH-HT2C receptors or to signaling pathways coupled to 5-B-HT2A. Further activation of A1 adrenergic receptors may be responsible for 2CB's stimulant effects. The term nexus flipping refers to the practice of mixing MDMA and 2CB.
This combination is reported to enhance the empathogenic and euphoric effects of MDMA while adding the visual and auditory effects of 2CB. Some users report a sense of anticipation or even anxiety during the onset of 2CB, which lasts about 45 to 75 minutes. This is often coupled with a pleasurable warmth or tingling, like electricity or pins and needles going up and down the body. There may be signs of physical and sexual arousal, including raised hairs, muscle spasms, erection, chills, tremors, and dilated pupils. Some people report experiencing gastrointestinal issues such as gas, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. At high enough doses, 2CB produces visual effects, which often include geometric patterns, after images and tracers, facial distortions, environmental drifting, and enhanced or shifting colors. Auditory hallucinations are also common. At higher doses, these hallucinations can become unpleasant, ugly, or even frightening. The peak effects of the 2CB experience last for two to four hours. Any nausea and discomfort have generally faded by this point. Touch, smell, taste, color, and sound all tend to be enhanced during this time, and many people report feeling squarely in the body, aware of their muscles and nerves, and merging with physical nature. Communication can break down during the height of a 2CB experience, although talking to others can become easier for some people. In any case, people usually see an increase in their empathy and sociability, conceptual thinking, introspective insights, and spiritual ideation are also common, especially when alone. There may be a slight softening of the ego. The LSD blinding hoax refers to a widespread urban legend that originated in the 1960s. The story claimed that several college students, while under the influence of LSD, stared at the sun until they went blind. This tale began on May 18, 1967, when California newspapers started reporting a horrific story about some Santa Barbara college students who supposedly damaged their eyes by staring at the sun while they were under the influence of LSD-1. The story was written up by the Los Angeles Times and other media outlets, causing a nationwide panic. However, this story was later debunked and declared false. Despite the widespread coverage and panic it caused, there was no evidence to support the claims made in the story. It's important to note that while LSD can cause hallucinations and altered perceptions, it does not lead to blindness from sun staring. This story is a prime example of the misinformation and fear surrounding the use of psychedelic substances during the 1960s. A psychedelic retreat is a guided multi-day program with a set or semi-set itinerary hosted by one or more facilitators where psychoactive substances or processes are administered to guests to improve their mental well-being. These retreats are often set in environments that facilitate personal connections with nature and allow quiet space for the administering of substances. Psychedelics like psilocybin and ayahuasca are commonly used. Other substances can include iboga, ketamine, LSD, and MDMA. Retreats may work with shamans. Other retreats may see more modern therapists and licensed practitioners helming the substance ceremonies. Most retreats incorporate integration periods between and after the psychedelics have been administered. This helps guests process their experiences and apply their insights to their daily lives. While a growing number of cities and one U.S. state so far have decriminalized psychedelics, they're generally illegal under the Controlled Substances Act. But that's just the U.S. Around the world, a few countries do allow the use of certain psychedelic substances. These include the Netherlands and Jamaica for psilocybin, as well as Mexico. There are legal protections for ayahuasca, too, in countries including Brazil, Costa Rica, Italy, Mexico, Colombia, and Peru. 
Psychedelic retreats are seen as an opportunity to work with professionals in some of the most beautiful backdrops in the world. They are an excellent option for those yearning to leave behind stressful routines for intense inward exploration. The three month rule for MDMA, often known as ecstasy or molly, is a harm reduction guideline that suggests users should wait at least three months between each use of the drug. This rule is based on the principle that MDMA, being a serotonergic drug, depletes the serotonin in your brain and it takes time for the body to replenish it. The three month period is considered a safe interval to help prevent neurotoxicity and potential loss of the drug's efficacy, often referred to as losing the magic. The Fadiman Protocol is a method of microdosing psychedelics named after Dr. James Fadiman, a psychologist and researcher who has been studying psychedelics for over 50 years. The protocol itself is quite simple. Take a microdose of a psychedelic, such as LSD or psilocybin, then abstain for two days, then repeat. The idea is that the microdose day is followed by an afterglow day and then a rest day. This cycle is repeated for several weeks Dr. Fadiman suggests that users keep a journal to note any changes in mood, productivity, or creativity. The aim is not to have a psychedelic experience, but to enhance normal functioning in day-to-day -day life. Dr. Fadiman's pioneering work has shown transformative experiences and benefits reported by microdosers, including relief from mental health issues and physical ailments. His interest in psychedelics dates back to the 1960s when he conducted a groundbreaking study on the positive influence of LSD on creativity. Despite the subsequent ban on psychedelic research, Fadiman continued his exploration and became an advocate for microdosing. Fadiman believes that microdosing can rebalance individuals and enhance their connection to their bodies. Like and subscribe.